Dr. Katie, welcome to the podcast. Thanks, Casey. It's really a treat for me to be here to talk with you and with your audience. Well, we're excited to have you. You know, we have yet to have a Medicare expert here on the show, but it's something that comes up during almost every single client meeting that we have, whether that's how much is health insurance going to cost, how much Mm -hmm. is Medicare going to cost, what about long-term care expenses, you know, how much can I budget for, what type of coverage should I get? It's just a very confusing space, and that's probably why you spent so much of your time getting highly educated in this space, because it is fairly common. Complex. I know you are a registered nurse, and yes. you also carry your PhD in healthcare economics and yes. nursing. Yes. I mean, I, I've told a couple of people that, and they said, "Who does that? You know, how do you <laughs> turn that into a business?" <laughs> so, how did you turn those credentials into a business? Well, you know, it really started for me when I was a visiting nurse in the early '80s. I learned very quickly that if I didn't understand Medicare and how to get care covered for people, I couldn't take good care of them. That is now my company name. But in order to take good care of people, every nurse in the organization had to understand Medicare. And I learned very quickly. And then along the way, I realized I needed more formal education background in business and economics. And I I did that. I'll be honest with you, though, I never thought that I would work on my own in my own business. I thought I would work in big organizations to be an advocate for them. But as the world evolved for me, People knew my background, and they kept asking me. And they said, Katie, I need help with my mom. I need help with my dad. And we're not able to get this done. And and once I looked at it really from the consumer side, no wonder. It is so confusing, and what a boondoggle. So then I started Good Care as a company 20 years ago and worked exclusively with consumers and small businesses and financial advisors to help people sort these things out, plan as best as possible, and then be able to go on with their lives in the best possible way. Do you, most people that are, say, selling Medicare, whether it's Medicare supplements, Medicare Advantage, mm-hmm. long-term care, things like that, yeah. you know, they don't really have this nursing background. I mean, no. I don't think probably anybody does that, that I've ever met. Yeah. Do you think it's really necessary or, I mean, maybe it's not necessary, but what do you bring to the table being a registered nurse that mm-hmm. can help people with this process? Yeah, I'm a registered nurse and actually a nurse practitioner. And what I bring to the table is the whole picture and understanding the clinical side of things and what people need to get good health care and good insurance. I'll tell you a startling statistic is that 90 to 95% of people in Medicare are overspending. And that's a shame when budgets are tight. And why are they overspending and how are they overspending? They don't have the right plan that meets their health care needs. Most typically, the medications they take are not as well covered in the plan they select it could, they could easily be well covered, better covered in another, or their doctors and hospitals and physical therapists and so on are not what you call in-network. So therefore, they either can't go to the people they want to go to or are paying too much out of pocket. So that's what I bring. I'm not a, an insurance broker. There are great brokers out there, but I do consulting. And the only person I represent is the consumer. And well, I wonder, I, I'm just thinking through this, mm-hmm. I, I'm, you know, there, there's a lot that goes into medications, right? Mm-hmm. Uh, you're selecting the right lot. coverage. And yes. with your background, maybe pharmaceutical experience, maybe you can even give them alternative medications that uh, they could switch to. And maybe that can help lower their costs on that side and also get them a lower cost plan. Well, I'll tell you what we do. We do focus on looking at the total picture. We're not their health care provider, but when we run into people, and we often do, we had a client recently <clears throat> that was taking a lot of what I call brand name medications. And I'm telling you, when we looked at Medicare plans for this person, his out-of-pocket cost was going to be $290,000 for a year for prescription drugs. But most of his medications had generic equivalents. And then we could drop it down. It still wasn't cheap, but it got to be about $7,000 out of pocket. That's a huge difference. Well, you and said, so, you said $290,000? Unbelievable. That was the, the biggest. We certainly see people over $100,000. But you took but them that, from two ninety dollars to seven. dollars Yes, we did. By <laughs> I think you justified your fee. More than that. And, and <laughs> made it easier for them because when I saw that number, I was startled. No less was this this person in their family. So what we did is we said, here's the list of medications. Go talk to your care provider. The vast majority of medications that are generic, 
equivalent worked just fine for people. And so we said, you got a little time, talk with your healthcare provider and see what you could do about switching. And guess what? It worked out great. That's amazing. For his healthcare and certainly for his budget. Well, and I don't want to get too far down this medication rabbit hole because we could probably stay there all day. But yeah. I think one of the things that some will be confused by or have never heard of before is a fee-only health insurance consultant like yourself. Mm-hmm. Yeah. You know, I, I only know a handful um, yes. that I've worked with in the past. I don't, I don't know that there's that many people like you out there. I only know a handful. And so just tell us, well, why is it important – to work with someone that is a, I mean, when it comes to fee-based financial advice, you know that, you know, someone's not going to get swayed to sell one product over Mm -hmm. another due to some commission or higher payout or revenue sharing agreement, conflicts of interest that they have. So are you saying that, that, that there's similar conflicts of interest in the health insurance planning space? And is that why it's important to work with a fee only health insurance expert like yourself? You know, the thing is that even people who are wonderful brokers, and we like actually referring to good brokers, they can't possibly in the Medicare space represent every company because of the rules and regulations they face and how they have to be registered with so many different lines of business. It's actually impossible for them to look across every possibility a person could face. That's number one. Number two, there are a few brokers who have a nursing or healthcare background, but my healthcare background brings a whole different Uh, influence to what we're doing. And we look bigger and broader, to be honest with you, than just the insurance plan. We look at people's health, their lifestyle. Do they want to travel when they're in retirement? Do they live in two places? Are they snowbirds? Those types of things. So we have more latitude in what, what we're doing. And then when we know of a good broker in the area, there's still a great role for them, and we will refer to them as well. Well, I know for me, you know, I, I've made these referrals out in the past because, I mean, I, I know what you would say to that. Yeah, there, there is a conflict of interest. I mean, whether there's sure. Medicare Advantage, Medicare Supplements, mm-hmm. traditional health care insurance, I, I don't know that most are aware of the conflicts of interest that exist. Can, can you yeah. just quickly uh, explain what those are? Well, here's the thing. When you are a broker, like any insurance relationship, the broker is paid by the company. It's not paid by you. Many people like that because they don't pay a fee when they go to see them. But there is an inher- inherent incentive for them to push certain things that a company may have. Many of them don't. Many of them are wonderful, good-hearted sure. people. But I'll tell you one thing legally that they cannot, and I think this is ridiculous, but this is the law. If a person already has a Medicare Advantage plan, which will talk about that has everything rolled together. Sometimes those are not the best plans for people, particularly folks who are real sick or people who live in an area where they don't work well. But the broker is prohibited by law to say you might be better with something else called a Medigap plan. And to me, that's, I don't function under that rule. And therefore, I have the breadth to say, you know, I see you're on an Advantage plan. I think you should use a Medigap plan. Whereas a broker, unless the person brings it up, cannot bring it up. And if the person knew about it, they wouldn't be seeing the broker. So that's a reason why, as actually years ago, we considered providing insurance ourselves. But I, I couldn't live within those limits and give consulting advice the way we wanted to a good care. Well, I think it's a pretty cool thing. I had mine. Uh, my mom uh, ran through a fee-only uh, health care process and mm-hmm. it saved her some money. And if nothing else, right. it gave her some good peace of mind that she right. was making good, solid uh, decisions. But I think the neatest thing about what you're doing is you're not just addressing the cost of the health insurance itself, yeah. but also maintaining health care. I mean, that's so mm-hmm. important as well. You can still have those discussions about what you need to do in order to minimize your ongoing health care costs by just taking better care of yourself. Yes, and if you have coverage that covers your health care needs, you will be able to take better care of yourself. And then you will feel better and you will be able to enjoy that retirement that you've worked so hard for. Well, I think we need to almost think, we, we think about investments, you know, our stocks and bonds, ETFs, mm-hmm. mutual funds, all these things as assets or home, mm-hmm. but your health is an asset too. Oh, absolutely. And it yeah. needs to be protected or it could, you know, cost you. It could reduce your long-term rate of return if you don't pay attention to your basic health needs at the same time. So let, let's talk on a, a, a bigger picture level here, just about healthcare in general. Mm-hmm. Uh, it just seems like healthcare has just become such a, you know, uh, heated topic 
lately. Yeah. Uh, yes, some it people think it's uh, skyrocketing in expenses. Yeah. Some people think it, that we're in a better place. Um, do you think that in general, healthcare has gotten dramatically more expensive over the last several years? Well, it isn't. Uh, the answer is yes. Medicare and all healthcare has become more expensive, but it's not just over the last several years. We've been in a what's called hyperinflation, higher than regular inflation, in healthcare for 40 years. So when you think about compound interest, when you invest your money or save it, the power of compound interest, well, the, the negative effect of hyperinflation in healthcare is that the costs are astronomically increasing to the point now when they're crushing us in so many ways. So you're seeing the cost of health care skyrocket. Oh, you're absolutely. seeing the, the coverage itself skyrocket as well. Your, your premiums are going up quite significantly. Mm -hmm. And so where do we go from here? If we continue to see this hyperinflationary environment for yeah. the cost of health care, yeah. is it going to continue like this? What do you think? The, I know you can't get out that crystal ball and tell me exactly, yeah. but in yeah. your mind, in your experience, with all your education, what do you think the future of healthcare is? Gee, the future of healthcare is bright in many ways because we have so many advances. But we also have opportunities actually to do it more cost effectively. We have not uh, made the most of technology, believe it or not, in healthcare and communication technologies. There are a lot of mistakes, frankly, that happen in healthcare that if we communicated better, that would be better for the patient. But in the meantime, costs are going up so high, but we haven't put, I don't think, enough muscle behind how to bring healthcare costs down, particularly prescription medications, are astronomically high compared to the rest of the world. And that's a real issue that we could attack and bring that cost down by making pharmaceuticals face the world price rather than the U.S. protected price, to be honest with you. If something's $1,500 elsewhere in the developed world and it costs $87,000 a year, that doesn't make any sense and wouldn't be tolerated in any other industry sector. So that's an important thing we need to work on, really, as a cult, but that's a cultural and a legal thing. So where does that leave the consumer? That's what I focus on then is mm -hmm. say, what's your best coverage that does make the most of mm -hmm. your medication coverage? And which ones should you stay away from? That, that That's something a consumer can do and review their plans regularly. Most people don't review their Medicare prescription drug plans every year, and they should, but they don't, and then those costs go up 40% over a three-year time frame. So the consumer really needs to take a look every couple, three years to say, could I do better? And often they could. Well, it sounds like to me, you're coming at it from a different angle than what we hear in the national media constantly. It's it's not about having the right health insurance, you know, whether we have national health care, Medicare for all, you mm -hmm. know. It's mm. not a problem with what we currently have. It's mm -hmm. the actual cost mm -hmm. of these things. It's the cost of health care that's driving these premiums up. And just because we get right. a new you know, the plan in place for the nation, yeah. it's not going to solve the issue because the real issue is how much more expensive health care costs here than outside the U.S. I mean, I, I guess I don't want to go too far down this road, but why is it that you know, a medication could cost eighty-seven thousand dollars here and fifteen hundred in another country for the same medication. You said laws, rules. Yeah, federal laws allow certain pricing to go on in the United States and limit where prescription drugs can come from. Your local pharmacy has to buy at the U.S. price, whereas if they bought it at the price that it's sold in Canada or the U.K. or another place it could be much more economical. And those are laws that need to change predominantly at the federal level. Huh. Well, well, okay. Well, th thanks for that. I, I find that very interesting. But I really want to get into this Medicare and healthcare discussion because it's mm -hmm. something that comes up so much yeah. uh, with the people we work with. And it's it's along these lines. It's a cost. What can I expect moving yeah. forward? What can I expect the cost to be in the future? How do I budget for something that has such a big question mark behind it? How, how do you think someone that's, say, 60, 64 years old, maybe they're retiring pre-Medicare, they're retiring mm -hmm. at Medicare age, how do you think they should budget for healthcare costs? I think folks should take a real look at what, what might it cost them in retirement. And you can do that. We actually have written a book that has information about it where you can see, okay, this is what the premiums in general are going to cost 
for me, even before you look at a prescription drug plan. So get an idea. And I always say when a person's in their early 60s, read the meter. Read the meter for yourself. Do you have a retiree health option or not? Many people don't anymore, but some do. And look and see what the cost will be. We had people recently who a couple, and the wife was in a teacher plan, and they were just about to retire. In fact, her husband was already retired. The wife was going to retire and expected to go on her plan. They had no idea how costly it was going to be to go on that teacher plan. We tend to think historically that those are the best plans and they're the best price, but in their case, it was going to cost them $2,500 more a year to stay on a teacher retiree plan, frankly, than to go with Medicare. Hmm. And if people think ahead of time and just look at the numbers, it takes a little time, but you can look at medicare.gov, their website, will give you some really good information about what it's going to cost, and you could even shop yourself. If you were to envision yourself today needing a plan, you'd go to medicare.gov on their website, and you can search down to the county and zip code level of what would plans cost if you needed to get one right now. And that's an exercise that we recommend for people to do, so they're not shocked when they get there. Well, and it sounds like if they come up with this premium, they figure out how much their costs are going to be for coverage, and then Mm -hmm. they figure out how much more their out-of-pocket costs could be on top of their premiums, then they should apply an inflation rate to that number that is substantially higher than maybe what they're used to. It's not 2 or 3%, maybe it's closer to 6%. You're absolutely right. What I recommend is that people have a separate budget line in their retirement projection. Many people over time have put health care into the everything category, and it doesn't belong there. Have a separate line in the retirement budget. Grow it by a higher inflation rate, two to four times the CPI. That's just the honest truth. And then figure out, I don't focus on big numbers like some of the organizations that say it's going to be $250,000 in retirement for your health care. I focus on cash flow. What will your cash flow need to be in a year to pay for your needs, generally speaking? Yes, it's an estimate, but you can do it. And that's what's really important is the cash flow. Where's the cash flow coming from for this? How much might it be? And that way you won't get to retirement. And if you don't plan for that, health care costs are not optional. You can't cancel them like a trip. You know, I I like that you said you look at it from a cash flow perspective, not a lump sum. I mean, we've seen all these studies that hit the headlines that you're going to need $250,000, $275,000, you know, to cover your health care costs in retirement, excluding long-term care costs. You go, boy, I I only have $500,000 saved. Right. How am I going to make it? And it's it's not that you need $250,000 the day you step into retirement. Maybe you need five thousand dollars a year. Well, that doesn't right. take two hundred fifty thousand dollars to create five thousand dollars a year, exactly. and so it's just we don't look at anything else that way. Social Security, we don't look at it that way. You get twenty thousand yeah. dollars in an annual benefit. You don't look at it and go, "I've got five hundred thousand dollars in benefits over my lifetime." Right. It's twenty thousand right. dollars a year. We're just looking right. at it and running the equation wrong. I think. Yes, I think that's good insight. Mm-hmm. And so what is really, is, is Medicare really all that different from traditional health care insurance? Medicare is a horse of a different color. It is different than traditional insurance in several ways. And some people may think it's better. Some people may think it's worse. And in my experience, in our experience of good care, it's all in how people put it together. Mm-hmm. The difference is that Medicare has multiple parts and pieces that you have to choose from. And if you'd like a quick overview of those parts, I could do it in a couple of minutes. Medicare Part A is hospitalization. Part B is outpatient. Part A we've paid for with our payroll tax. We have not paid for Part B, and everything outpatient is very expensive now. So you get the A and the B, and then you have to decide, am I going to get a prescription drug plan? You really need to have one. Some people think, well, if I don't take medications, I don't need one. But the day you get sick and have expensive medications, you'll be sorry. And then there's something called a supplemental. People use that term. And there's two main ways to put that into place. It's a Medicare Advantage plan, which rolls all of your coverage together. And then that's kind of similar to an HMO or a work style plan you've had already. But if you keep your separate Medicare A and B and get something called a Medigap plan, that works 
differently. It's more costly on a monthly basis, but in a, in a year's time, it actually costs less if you have high health care costs. So there are a lot of choices along the way that are individual. And like I mentioned earlier, plans vary down to the county and zip code level. Well, you know, we often joke if the IRS had an easy way of doing something or a difficult <laughs> way, they'd probably choose the more difficult way. I, I kind of see it along the same lines here. It is a complex stage of life. As you step into it, there's so many different parts and so much to understand that it's yeah. It's kind of difficult to, to grasp and some yeah. can experience overwhelm. And one of the things is just, do I really need to know all this stuff? You know, right. do I need to go back to college to understand which plan that I should get? How right. much self-education do you think someone should do around Medicare before they sign up? I think they should do a reasonable amount, but not overwhelm themselves. And they could, you know, we do webinars ourselves that go into more detail at times. We have our book, of course. But also, there are great resources in every community. And <clears throat> the place to go to find that resource that will have community sessions to tell you what's going on where you live and help you figure out plans where you live. And that's a website for your folks to know. It's called eldercare.gov. And you go to eldercare.gov and put your zip code in. And it will tell you <clears throat> what organization in your area is part of something called the State Health Insurance Program. It operates in every county in the United States, and their specific job is to assist consumers for no fee with Medicare choices. They'll do consumer group meetings, or they'll be at senior centers and that type of thing. The key thing about that resource is shop early, get on the list, go to their sessions, sign up early, because in the fall in particular, when it's open enrollment, those sessions fill up very quickly, and mm -hmm. that's why you've got to think ahead. But it's a great resource. So eldercare.gov, put in your zip code and find who does what's called the SHIP program, State Health Insurance Program, in your area. And these folks are completely independent. They will help you look at what options are available for you or your family member. Well, we'll make sure we put that link in the show notes. So if you want to catch that, retirewithpurpose.com forward slash podcast. Just go to the episode show notes. The link will be right there. So don't don't take any notes while you're driving. Um, sure. Another great resource, though. I mean, you, you've you put together a 40, 50-page book here that is a, actually a fairly easy read about a not-so-exciting topic, uh -huh. you know, but, it, but it's an important <laughs> one. And yeah. for those of you that want to get a copy of Making the Most of Medicare Guide for Baby Boomers, uh, if you you just go down, leave a review for us on the podcast and shoot us an email at info at howardbailey.com. We're going to send these out to you. Dr. Katie has provided us with a box full of these things so that we can make sure you stay on top of these important topics. So Katie, we, we talk about Medicare, we talk about health insurance, how it's changed over the years. We know how health care has changed. We've kind of went over that. How has Medicare evolved over the years? Medicare has evolved in several important ways over the years. It was signed into law in 1965 by LBJ, and the first Medicare recipients were President Truman and his wife. And at that time, it was Medicare A for hospitalization and B for outpatient. Well, we have certainly become more sophisticated in our health care, and the outpatient benefit at the time cost $5 a month. And now it costs a person out of their pocket at least $130 a month, and the government kicks in a whole lot more than that. Why is it more costly now? We do everything outpatient. You can do outpatient surgeries, chemotherapies, and so on. So Medicare has evolved to, <clears throat> pardon me, <clears throat> keep up <clears throat> with the sophistication of healthcare and covering anything that is legally approved, basically. But what was added um, about mm, six, eight years ago was prescription drug coverage. That was never a part of original Medicare. And one change in the world has been that fewer and fewer people have a retiree health benefit, number one. Mm. Or they had have a plan, but as I mentioned with that teacher plan, it's very expensive. And now more people need that prescription drug coverage. So that was a newer benefit that was added in a few years ago and has changed somewhat over time. But it's better than not having drug coverage. But to be honest with you, it's it's the most complex part of Medicare. We uh, thank you for giving us compliment on making our book easy to read. And we call it kind of the cliff notes of Medicare mm. to make it as simple as possible. But the prescription drug benefit is new. The other thing is people's lives have changed a lot. People are more mobile. 
um, where they want in retirement, where they want to go. There are so many choices in healthcare. We didn't used to have urgent care, all that kind of stuff that can work into a Medicare plan. But given it's more complex in the healthcare world, you have to know more about your Medicare plans than certainly my parents needed to know. Right. So it's getting more and more complex, it sounds, yeah. getting down the rabbit hole here. So that leads to probably a lot of mistakes. And you could probably yes. put these mistakes in two categories. You've got, you know, the, the number one mistake, maybe the most common mistake that people make, and then the one that's most costly, the biggest mistake. Mm -hmm. Can you speak on those two things that you see most often? The two things that, well, yeah. <clears throat> one is people don't enroll on time into Medicare and misunderstand when they need to start their Medicare plan. Full retirement age is now 66, but Medicare starts at 65, but people are working beyond 65. Sometimes if you're working beyond 65 or your spouse, you don't need to get in to Medicare right away, but sometimes you do. So, but if a person misses their window of opportunity to get in, then they have to wait to enroll, have to pay for their health care, and that's very costly. And then they'll pay a penalty the rest of their life. So that's number one is not knowing when to get into Medicare. Number two really is plan selection. As I mentioned earlier, are my medications covered the way, the best possible way they could be? That varies widely amongst plans. And are the care providers I wanna see and hospitals I wanna go to, are they in the network of the plan or are they not? And, and when people don't look ahead, most people don't look ahead. Most people buy on premium and brand name. And they'll look for the cheapest plan, which I understand that. And if you don't necessarily need the most expensive plan either. But also, or they'll talk to a friend, and the friend says, well, I have this plan. And they'll say, well, right. I'm going to go with that. But their health could be very different than yours. Right. E even with spouses, we often recommend two different plans because people's health is di are different. And one plan will suit you know, the husband, and the other one will suit the wife. So you talk about one of the biggest mistakes being penalties that yes. people can face because they, they forgot to sign up or they forgot to notify the, the Medicare administration that they're going to continue working. And mm -hmm. so then they face lifetime premium penalties. Yeah. And But th there's an other, another penalty that a lot of people are, or, or quite a few people that we're meeting with are starting to fall into. And that has to do with their income, IRMA, income related oh, yeah. adjustment amounts. <laughs> yes. Can you talk a little bit about avoiding those additional penalties? Sure. Here's the thing. Medicare did change actually under the Bush administration and has continued to today to adjust to change people's Medicare premiums to a certain degree for Medicare Part B and for the privilege to participate in a drug plan. You need to have that separately, but it's called, it, it's related to person's income. The higher the income, the more you're going to pay for those two different elements there. It's called the income-related monthly adjustment amount. Again, it's covered in our book. And people definitely need to plan ahead to say, if I'm going to be in a higher income group, it's going to cost me more. Or what could I do with my financial advisor to change my mix of where my cash flow is coming from in retirement so it doesn't go into that income calculation? Because Medicare has a very specific way it looks at your adjusted gross income and tax exempt interest. But if you can keep things outside of that calculation, for example, health savings accounts, people can put a lot of money and sock it away in there and even invest it. And then if they use that in retirement and their Medicare costs, that is part of cash flow, but not part of taxes. There are certain things that people could do if you invest in a Roth and um, retirement account. You're going to pay the tax going in, but the money coming out is tax free, therefore doesn't impact your Medicare premium. So that's why I really recommend for folks now, if you're a couple, married couple, filing jointly, and you make over $170,000 a year, or an individual making over $85,000 a year, that's when you want to plan ahead. If in retirement, you're going to be above that, you're going to pay more, you won't get any more, you're going to pay more, and work with your advisor to say, what can I do? If, and there are several other options we didn't even talk about yet, that could give me cash flow in retirement, but keep my income for the Medicare purpose below that threshold or in the, in the lowest tier possible. There's six tiers now. And have that conversation ahead in your early 60s so that you can position yourself best as possible. Or if that's the way it's going to be, at least plan ahead and don't be shocked. 
Oh, Irma. Yeah, nobody oh, likes Irma. Irma. Gosh. Right. Yeah, right. We want to get know, ahead of her. We don't want to meet Irma in retirement, so we got to no. get ahead of this uh, thing. Right, and, unless Irma's your nice old aunt, you know what I mean? <laughs> I think it's kind of insulting to, a, a you know, they're pro- it's an older name, and there's some lovely older ladies out there, and it's not fair to besmirch their nice name. Well, we sure don't like this Irma. Let's be no, very specific don't. about yeah. that. We want to we want to make sure we avoid her at all costs. Yes. And you know, you talk about tax planning, and we've helped mm-hmm. people in this realm um, mm-hmm. with minimizing not just Medicare premium penalties, but also getting substantially cheaper coverage um, on in the marketplace just by mm-hmm. keeping their income very low. I mean, we've yeah. got individuals that uh, I I got one that comes to mind all the time because he's just so proud of himself. You know, working with mm-hmm. us. We've been able to get him next to free coverage. It costs him less now in retirement pre-65 than it did when he was working with his employer. And then there's other people out there that find that some of those strategies that you're utilizing, they say, well, that's immoral. I'm just going to go ahead and pay my penalty or pay my Mm -hmm. premium, you Mm -hmm. know, and they they wouldn't have had to had they just followed the letter of the law and done good tax planning. They would have been able to reduce Medicare premiums and reduce their health insurance premiums. What are your thoughts on the morality of this? Hmm, the morality. Uh, I honestly think that doing what's right includes what the options are in front of you. And I don't, I see it as being good to be able to minimize your costs as much as possible, maximize your choices in healthcare so you could take care of yourself and your family. And I'm a nurse at heart, and that's where I come from, is do your best for yourself and your family. And if that's the way it's part of doing it, then, you know, go ahead and do it. You're not doing anything that's illegal or, in my opinion, immoral. And people who don't plan ahead, what you do is you shoot yourself in the foot. Mm-hmm. And, and it's very painful later. And you cannot undo some of these things. And then you're going to say, I've worked hard for my retirement nest egg. Maybe I want to retire before I'm 65. And you're talking about income-related premiums for folks under 65, and it could be substantially lower And, but the nest egg is only so big. You've got to preserve that for a long time. And so you got to think about from that perspective, is it right for me to spend money now that I could save and then perhaps cheat myself later when I have long-term care needs and I've spent overspent when I didn't need to. So it's complicated. And, you know, at the end of the day, I always say it's important to sleep at night. I tell people that all the time. Here's your options. Here's the information. You make your choice, go with your gut, and it's, you know, sleep is a beautiful thing. It's good for your health. So if you can sleep at night, that's what's important to me. Well, I think that's important, too. And we might sleep better at night if we've got a little bit extra income coming in, a little less going out, and a little bit yeah. more in our bank account. Yeah. And, you know, I, I kind of liken this to tax planning, you know. I mean, we, we follow the letter of the law. You yeah. know, we, we, we don't get any extra reward by paying more than we're legally required to. So right. take the deductions, take the credits, follow the law, yeah. know the law, and you can keep more of your hard-earned dollars, and they're not going to penalize you for it because you just – you did what they put in place for you to do in the first place. I mean, that, 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 that's my personal take on it. But again, hey, I guess you got to sleep well at night. So yes. one of the other things that could cost a lot is what's called the donut hole. And oh. I think there's a lot of confusion about this donut hole. Yes. Uh, it's not one of those tasty things you get from the, the donut man. It's something yes. a little bit more, de- well, I guess that, that could also be deadly, but it could be a little <laughs> bit more deadly than that. So tell, tell us a little bit about the donut hole and how we avoid it. Yes. The donut hole that you're referring to, Casey, is an odd nickname, I think. I don't know who came up with it. It's really a coverage gap in the middle of the prescription drug benefit. And I always say that it is insulting to my grandma, Nina. She used to make wonderful donut holes. And when I was a little kid, and we went nuts for them. We've got Nina, we've got Irma. We've got, yeah, those (laughs) great ladies who took good care of us. And you know what? The donut hole in Medicare is not a sweet treat like my grandma, Nina donut holes. It's truly a coverage gap. They don't call Medicare prescription drug coverage a high deductible plan, but that's what it is in effect. That um, We have a chart in our book that shows you at different points, there's four different phases of what's covered. And there comes a point pretty early in prescription drug coverage for many people who take brand name drugs and more expensive medications, where they're going to pay more out of pocket. So in addition to premium, people this year have to spend 
over $5,100 out of pocket before they're in the part of prescription drug coverage called catastrophic. And then the coverage cost drops fairly, you know, can be substantial, but there's no cap in Medicare prescription drug coverage. And that's uh, something that's been talked about at the national level to fix, uh, hasn't been fixed yet. And we have a lot of folks in our practice here because of the medications they need to take, you know, there are no generic substitutes. They could be spending five, seven, ten thousand dollars $10,000 out of pocket. People with diabetes, uh, insulin and diabetes medications can be very expensive. And so people also don't have to be deathly ill to be spending a lot. And that's where it's worth looking ahead when you're in your early 60s. If you're diabetic, you know it now. And take a look and see what can I forecast for myself? Because in addition to premium, medications can really add up. But when you mentioned earlier, really looking at all the options for people, because a lot of people say to me, Katie, how can people pay all this? It costs so much money. How can my parents keep up with this? Mm -hmm. Well, there is financial support for folks who are in limited incomes, and it can help them with their Medicare premiums. It can help with their prescription drug costs out of pocket. So that's something to be aware of and look at what's available in your area. Again, that SHIP program, the state health insurance program, can help people in their area, particularly I'm thinking of the folks on this podcast, it might not be them, but it might be their parents that they're taking care of, whose incomes are, are very limited. And they are helping mom and dad when they go to the store and they pick up the prescriptions and they themselves are paying for it. But there could be assistance for people who just can't pay these costs at all because some of them, when you talk about the donut hole and prescription coverage can be very costly, but there is help for folks out there whose incomes are very limited. Well, if we have means, is there some type of supplement plan or some way that we can uh, control this cost in some way? There is no supplement plan beyond prescription drug coverage that works. There are some people who still have retiree health benefits. And one time one will recommend people to keep it, even if it's more costly in a premium, is if they have high prescription drug costs. Because most retiree plans, like most employer plans, have a limit on what you'll spend. But beyond that, there isn't anything. So the best thing to do is to shop for the right plan. For example, I had a person recently who said, oh, and I need to take this injectable medication four times a year. It keeps me healthy. And this person's very healthy and active and doing stuff. He thought it was going to cost him $45,000. Well, that would be true on one plan. Another plan, it would cost him $5,000. Now, $5,000 isn't small, but it's a whole lot less than forty five. dollars So really, I can't say enough for looking for your health coverage and your prescription drug coverage and maximizing that coverage, whether it's, and then every person has an opportunity in the fall of every year to shop around and say, gee, what I had last year has become so expensive. Maybe they started me on a new medication or something. And take a look at what your options are for the following year to see, well, could I do better? Uh and some people think that a Medicare supplement is going to solve this problem. Uh, yeah. it's, it's, it, talk to us a little bit about Medicare supplements and what they actually are for, what they do. Yeah, Medicare supplements, it's a term that people use. There are two different types. One is called a Medigap plan. One is called Medicare Advantage. They're all private insurance, regulated by the government, but private insurance. A lot of people think everything in Medicare is government insurance, but it's not at all. So a Medigap plan, <clears throat> it's kind of confusing. There are 11 different styles. In most states, three states only have a couple of styles. Most states have 11. Uh, again, we look at those in our book. I recommend that people get an F plan or a G plan right now. They're the most comprehensive. Some of them are not, I don't think they're valuable at all. So you want a solid plan that's going to cover as much as possible of the co-payments and co-insurance for Medicare A and B. Because Medicare A is designed to cover 80% of costs and B, generally speaking, and the consumer pays 20, and sometimes more. And that can add up to be a lot. So that's one way to do it is a Medigap plan. Another way is to do Medicare Advantage plan, which is more of your HMO group health style. And- Just tell us a little bit about what, what's that mean, HMO group health style? A health maintenance organization or a preferred provider organization. It's very similar to what you had when you were employed, where you have one card and it's all about the network what healthcare providers are in a network or not. A Medigap plan 
has no network. You can go to any doctor, any hospital in the United States that accepts yeah, so Medicare. What, in what type of markets or what kind of environment might you be in where you'd say, I'd really, I, I'd benefit more from a medic, traditional Medicare versus a Medicare Advantage? Where you, what, what the big variables of whether I should go Medicare Advantage or Medigap are a few things. Where do you live? Some places where you live, a Medicare Advantage plan, also known as a Medicare Part C, is accepted by lots of providers. You're talking to me from Rochester, New York today. Medicare Advantage plans up here are widely accepted. And if you go to New York City, downstate, they're not well accepted at all. Mm -hmm. So they vary regionally. And so you want to know for sure if you have a Medicare Advantage plan but no one takes it, you haven't helped yourself. So if you're planning on moving or being mobile during retirement, a traditional Medicare might be a better way to go. Well, people say traditional Medicare, and then I recommend a Medigap plan to go with that. Mm -hmm. Yes, that might be better. And the yeah. other thing is a Medicare Advantage plan <clears throat> typically has a lower premium. That's great if you don't have too many health care needs mm -hmm. because they have a higher out-of-pocket limit, somewhere around $6,700. So you want to balance that off to say, okay, I like that little premium, but if I go to the doctor a lot and have a lot of things I need and medical supplies, a Medicare Advantage plan isn't going to be my best bet. I'd go with a Medigap type of situation. You know, we see people come in that have Medicare supplements and there's a wide range of premiums oh, and then yes. we run them quotes and when yeah. we run the quote, we can cut their cost in half oh, for the absolutely. same exact plan. Yes. You know, it, and with all the plans being the same, why would we pay more to one insurance carrier than another? Yes. What you're referring to, I think, is a Medigap plans yes. are offered by a wide variety of insurance companies and the benefits are all prescribed by law. Yeah. So if you have a Medicare, Medigap G plan, it's the same benefit. It doesn't matter who you buy it from. And right. you're right that the premiums can be twice as much in one company versus another. And there is no reason to spend more on the plan. What I recommend is you want a solid company with a good track record. Basically, those are your brand name companies that you're familiar with. If you've never yeah. heard of the company and they're cheap, I wouldn't go with them. But look at your brand name companies and then amongst them, Look at your best price because you're right. You could cut their premium in half many times with the well, same. I think benefit. that's an important point. I, and I sure it's like why did they end up spending so much more for this carrier when they could have got it substantially cheaper over here? Right. That's why you go to a fee-only Medicare provider like yourself because somebody's getting a higher commission for the higher right. premium than the lower premium for the right. same exact coverage. So yeah. you want to work with somebody that's independent, maybe fee-only at least to to figure out which coverage you need initially. I, but then there's a lot of things that Medicare doesn't cover. Your, your mm. Medicare Medigap doesn't cover. Your yeah. Medicare Advantage doesn't cover. Ran mm -hmm. into situation recently with my mom she's got some major dental surgery that she needs done yeah. what type of unforeseen circumstances might we run into that we haven't thought about the maybe traditional medicare medicare advantage and supplements will, will or sure. gaps well, medigap I, you, won't cover. you mentioned dental i think that's a standard thing that people will spend money on in retirement medicare has never covered dental and so look to see some medicare advantage plans will give you a little bit of a dental benefits basically a couple of cleanings some won't. Be careful you're not paying more for that. There are a few uh, private dental plans available on the market. There used to be none, but now there are some. People could look at those to say, is that going to help me? The other thing that's not covered in Medicare that's a common thing is eyewear. And I mm -hmm. find it confusing because people will say, I want vision insurance. Well, your Medicare covers your doctor for your glaucoma checks or other things. But basically, the rest of it is eyewear. And so shop around for your best price. There are a lot of discounts now on eyewear and contacts, and even people are buying it on the Internet. So be a smart shopper for your eyewear the way you would be for anything else. When you if Dental, if you don't have dental insurance, talk to your doctor ahead of time. Don't wait till you get to the counter and they give you the big bill. Say, you know, I don't have insurance. I would like your best possible price and make sure you can afford it. And if not, dental care is competitive and shop around. And then the other big category that isn't covered is long-term care and that many people need well, it. Let's get into that in just a minute. I, I okay. want to cover that broadly. Okay. But uh, before you go there, I just want to know your opinion though. You talk about vision, you talk about yeah. your dental, and yeah. there are plans out there that you can get vision coverage, yeah. dental coverage, yeah. 
you know, when you get into this demographic, you get over yeah. 65, you start to have more of these issues, dental sure. problems, vision yeah. problems. Yeah. Do you think people should have those types of plans? Are you an advocate of those plans, those supplement plans? I'm an advocate of people to have good coverage that's going to work for them. The reason I say it that way is some of the plans are worth buying and some are not. So look and see, how much am I paying? Is there an exclusion period if I sign up for new dental care and I can't use it for six months? If the limit that they cover is really low, if your doctor isn't in their network, it's probably not worth buying, but some mm -hmm. of them, so you have to look at the details. The other thing is, that's an example where you want to save a certain amount ahead of time so you're not yeah. shocked to say, okay, I've got to get, I've got to buy glasses. So it, it really depends. When people are leaving employment, and they might have something called COBRA coverage, which is a continuation of employer coverage. Even if they don't have retiree plans, but they're leaving, let's say they're leaving employment, they're over 65. Their health insurance basically needs to be Medicare. But if they have a COBRA option, at least for 18 months, that's economical and they like, they might actually be able to continue their dental and their vision coverage for at least 18 months at a discounted price because those group plans can be pretty economical. Well, I like the idea of budgeting for those mm -hmm. things, the dental yeah. and vision, because yeah. as you said, they're competitive but across yeah. providers and you might right. be able to negotiate the price. You can also budget for those things. They shouldn't be catastrophic in nature unless you're getting yes. some gold encrusted glasses, which aren't necessary, right? Yeah. right. Um, but you know, mm -hmm. excluding long-term care costs, home health care, assisted living, nursing home care, that whole yeah. long-term care discussion, yeah. You know, sometimes we, you know, I've ran into people that have this fear that, you know, even with really good coverage, so mm -hmm. I get all, I get the best Medicare plan, the best Medigap plan, or the best mm -hmm. Medicare Advantage plan, that I could still lose everything if I have a catastrophic health problem. There all, are no guarantees. Um, what are your thoughts on, how would you answer someone that has that fear? I think that that's understandable when people have that fear because they've probably seen it happen to someone. Yeah. That's where I say you've got to plan up front. Most of the horror stories I've heard about Medicare are people who were in a plan that didn't cover well, to be honest with you. And there's a totally different plan that would help them out. So make sure you are doing the best for yourself or your family when you go into Medicare and reevaluate it on a regular basis. And Medicare itself, uh, the big ticket hospitalization, and outpatient, if you have a medic, I'll be honest with you, the most comprehensive coverage you can get is Medicare A and B and a Medigap F or a G. And you won't have any surprises for those big ticket items. Prescription drugs are a different story mm -hmm. because there's no cap in the prescription drug programs. You just have to be right. very careful about those. And if you do wind up in that category above $10,000, $12,000, work with your doctor. In some cases, with those super expensive medications, they might have discount plans with the uh, pharmaceutical company or something that, that can help out. But it, it is an issue there. But it's, That's good stuff. It, it's, a, it's the lack of planning that hurts the most. So it's really, if you have good mm -hmm. Medicare coverage, get your A, B, get a Medigap plan, mm -hmm. get an F plan, G plan. Now, you know, the, the prescription drugs are where you can really get hurt. And so there is some truth there, but it's going to be across yeah. the, the, the prescription drug realm because we don't have a maximum. But then... Yes as you mentioned, uh, long-term care. So mm -hmm. we're going to close our discussion with uh, a, 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 a discussion about long-term care. You know, yeah. some people believe that, well, Medicare is going to cover that. If I have to go mm -hmm. to a nursing home, I've got Medicare. But mm -hmm. that's not necessarily the case. Yes, you're right. Medicare does not cover long-term care per se. Even if you look at the Medicare booklet, it says you get 100 days. Well, very few people even get 100 days. Most of them are three weeks. And it's for something specific after, say, a hip replacement or something. It is not long-term personal care that a person needs in a skilled nursing facility, assisted living, or at home. And that isn't covered by Medicare. They would cover home care very shortly after hospitalization, but not in the long term. And I think what's important is to <clears throat> think ahead and try and envision where will you be. Do you think you'll be where you are now? Will you move closer to family or something like that? Because it isn't just the money. It's how is it going to work for you? You can't envision everything. But how might it work? And then you can look if you want to estimate the cost of care and figure out, okay, I'm going to cover a certain amount myself, but maybe I get 
a hybrid plan. I'm not sure you probably are very familiar with those, the life insurance with a long-term care rider or an annuity or some of these <clears throat> one-pay plans. So there's a variety of options people should talk with you about to say, okay, I, I know that I can cover X dollars in my savings, but if I go beyond that, how will I be able to manage that type of truly catastrophic cost? And, and again, it's all about planning ahead. So you're saying, let's figure out where you might need care. Is it mm -hmm. going to be where you live today or somewhere else? There's a drastic difference in the cost yes. of care in Indiana Perfect. versus California and New York. Yeah. And so yeah. we want to know where we might need the care, budget mm -hmm. out, put together your retirement plan, see how much you might mm -hmm. be able to absorb in cost for your for yourself. Maybe you want 100% mm -hmm. covered or maybe you want it partially covered mm -hmm. and then evaluate those different options from there. Mm -hmm. So I've got a, a fan question here, which will be a good lead in uh, to what I would think is a, a, a good direction for us. Brian Abel asks, do you recommend long-term care insurance as part of a retirement expense? If so, which kind with which options? Wow. I, I recommend long-term care planning as part of a retirement plan. And so, like, like I said, it's bigger to me, it's bigger than insurance. Mm -hmm. Insurance may be a part of it. And then what I say is work with your financial advisor because there are more options than ever now of what type of plan, what the pricing might be. The underwriting can change dramatically. Underwriting means, will I qualify for a certain type of plan or, or another type of plan? And they are very driven by health situations. And even if you have some pre-existing conditions, doesn't mean you will be excluded from every plan, but you might be excluded from some. And so <clears throat> I think you've got to think about it and work with your professional advisor on making those choices. And if yeah. you don't, and you need care, <clears throat> you will really regret it. Not yeah, having so, thought so about plan it. For it. At plan least for recognize it. it it's yeah. kind of like, I mean, it's, I mean, think about death. A lot of people don't want to think about death, but no. it's one of those things that's inevitable. Maybe long-term mm -hmm. care isn't inevitable, but there's highly high likelihood that it could occur. Mm -hmm. So why not plan for it? And mm -hmm. then the second part of that question being which kind of options, you know, there's so many different options out there mm -hmm. today. Uh, we've seen a drastic reduction in the traditional type of long-term care insurance. Most people are used to that, that uh, mm -hmm. use it or lose it insurance. You pay your premium. And then, yeah. you know, if, if you never use it, you know, it's kind of like your car insurance or your home insurance. Right. Um, now we're actually seeing more of these hybrid policies being sold than traditional long-term care insurance. Mm -hmm. Why do you think that is? I think that you hit the nail on the head when you said use it or lose it. The premiums on what <clears throat> traditional long-term care insurance, those premiums are really high. Those plans are hard to get. <clears throat> um, the premiums hard to qualify for. Hard to qualify for. Mm -hmm. The premiums are escalating. So even if you still qualify, you might it might become prohibitively expensive to you. And a lot of people say, if I'm going to spend three or five thousand dollars a year, I feel like I'm throwing money down the drain if I don't use it. I do believe that's why the what you're calling hybrid plans, which typically are life insurance with a long-term care rider or an annuity with a long-term care rider, that those plans <clears throat> are very appealing to people. Plus, some of those one pay or five pay plans where you have a chunk of money and if you don't use it for long-term care, you can get a return out of that anyway. And that way a person <clears throat> always gets something and that is appealing to people. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And you know, this increasing premium thing, I mean, it, premiums mm -hmm. have, you know, mm -hmm. skyrocketed for some mm -hmm. of those older long-term care insurance plans that were issued say in the nineties and early two yeah. thousands. Mm -hmm. uh, and then I've read some articles, I've heard some long-term care insurance, uh, you know, salespeople say, well, yeah, that's not the case anymore. You can buy this policy today. You don't have to worry about premium yeah. skyrocketing anymore. They've got it under control. Do you think they have it under control or, or can we expect to buy a policy that costs three grand a day and it costs 6000 in 10 years? I think that unless the plan you're buying guarantees that your premiums won't change and, and that they don't unless you're talking about like a five-pay plan, you do it over five years and that's done, or a one-pay plan, you know, those are pretty expensive. People have to have a pretty good chunk of change to do it, but that um, to say that that typical old-fashioned long-term care insurance has figured out all the problems in the underwriting. I don't agree with that. It's highly unlikely. They will continue to escalate in cost, and there is no reason to think that they, they won't. Will it level off? I'm not so sure. 
how soon it will level off. And so mm -hmm. that makes it difficult for people to feel comfortable that, okay, I'm paying $3,000 now. Will it be $6,000 in five years? And that just doesn't fit into my picture. Or, you know, companies leave the market space and someone else buys those plans. They still can work, though, for people. Yeah. And, it, and it really, um, there is variability there. So right. to say that it's all figured out, no. I don't think well, it is. I think that there are some that will find it more appealing. I, I found individuals, you know, we might only do one or two traditional long-term care policies a year, mm -hmm. but we do you know, you know, tons of these hybrid policies just because mm -hmm. that, I mean, that's what people want these days. And frankly, I don't want to be sitting across the table from someone 10 years from now and say that, tell them that their premiums doubled and I can't do anything about it. Right. I don't really want to have those no. types of discussions sure. for the most part. Right. Um, yeah, and and I I own long term care insurance myself, um, mm -hmm. but I have a hybrid policy. Uh, mm -hmm. My parents are the same way, mm -hmm. and you know, I'm in my mid thirties. You know, my parents are in their mid sixties, mm -hmm. and you know we've all gotten it at, at different times. I've had it since I was in my early twenties, mm -hmm. and and I, I know that's unusual, um, mm -hmm. but and it seems to go against kind of the gradient of your typical advice. I, mm -hmm. uh, you've heard, well, don't even look at it to your sixty. Some people say. You know, some right. people say 55. Right. When should we start looking at long-term care insurance? When should we buy it? And who should we buy it from? Right. When should we start looking at long-term care need is what I think about. And depending on, on your, it is a, somewhat age-driven because there's another piece, particularly in, in younger years, is disability insurance. And person who is, is, you know, and that's to have a conversation with your advisor person who's having a family still in the working years and needs, particularly if they work by, on their own and don't have any through work, disability insurance is an important piece of the long-term care puzzle at a certain point in life. And then beyond that, you know, people think, well, I'm going to wait till my 60s. Well, maybe your health won't support you getting that coverage mm -hmm. in your 60s. And I also, it, that's what's important to think about. Where do you see yourself for your long-term care. And you don't, I, you know, no one has a crystal ball, but think about what it might be involving for you and for your family. People might think, well, I've got kids and they'll take care of me. Well, if your kids are all working outside the home and have families, if they have resources from a long-term care policy or a hybrid somehow, make it a whole lot easier for them to take care of you. And who should you buy it from? I always think you want to go with reputable companies that have a solid track record. And I'm sure that, that you and your team only recommend those types of companies. And what about the type of agent that we work with? Is there some type of quality or that, that we should be looking for in that, that individual? The qualities of a good agent, I think, are, and you, you'll know it by working with them, people who are up front with you. Because good agents can tell you ahead of time, listen, we're going to pre-screen for some of these things so that you can find out, would this company even consider me? Because you don't want to go into a company and get declined and have that on your record. It, it, an agent should be able to pre-screen things for you and, and steer you in one way or another. And to work with a financial advisor, what can I afford? Because if, if, depending on your level of assets, you don't want to also overbuy long-term care insurance, or I'm in favor if you want a traditional long-term long care insurance, is to buy what I call a short fat policy, meaning you get a lot of benefit but for a short period of time, maybe three years. I do not even recommend a lifetime policy anymore because most people don't need long-term care more than three years. And if you can afford to cover those three years, the likelihood of more, and yes, people are afraid of it, but you want to be able to afford, a, you know, have a premium you could afford and then protect also your other assets best as possible so that you haven't imp impoverished your spouse, for example, by spending all the money on care caring for one, one member of the couple. So it's a complicated decision, I really do mm -hmm. think. And people need folks like you to help them walk through those options. So let's walk through the options of someone that's going to spend the time with you to do it, uh, that's a financial planner, integrate it with the financial plan, not just standalone long-term yep. care person, yes. um, because it is a part that should be integrated with the financial planning process. Mm -hmm. And you talk about all these options, talk about hybrid life insurance, hybrid annuities, you know, yeah. short-term paid plans. Yeah. Well, not every advisor is going to have all those options no. in their toolbox. No. So you need to be no. working with an independent agent that can walk you through all those options and find the best one that fits you.
Um, you know, I think it's a good wrap up for this section. I've got another question here from our fan, Greg Presley. And if you've got a question you'd like to get answered here, you just uh, email us at info at howardbailey.com. His question is with the newer life long term care insurance products, so mm-hmm. hybrid policies mm-hmm. uh, available these days, do you think it's still a good decision to keep our old Indiana partnership long term care policy in force? So, you know, and I see this come up quite often. They, they have these old long term care policies, they get a hybrid policy, or maybe they just buy a life insurance policy that now had, maybe they have an old life insurance policy, they, yeah. they change it for a new one, now they can accelerate the death benefit for long-term care needs, yeah. they cancel the old one, keep the old one, it's a dangerous predicament for an advisor to be in to say, oh yeah, go ahead and cancel it, and yeah. then their new policy doesn't have enough coverage in it. Right, right. Well, when you mention partnership policies, they are in most states in the United States, and the value of a partnership policy is protection, generally speaking, of other assets, such that if you use long-term care for a certain amount of money or a certain amount of time, your assets are protected and you can use Medicaid as your backup long-term care insurance provider. So again, complicated, you want to look at what other assets the person has. Homes will always be exempt if you've got a couple, but it it can offer a lot of protection beyond providing dollars for long-term care. It Mm. can help protect your other assets. And so would you need both? Maybe. It depends on the amount of money that's covered. Some people have those plans with their $100 a day. Most places are a $300 a day skilled nursing facility. So if you have 100 bucks a day, you'll be discounted, but you're still going to be paying $200 a day. Where is that going to come out of the rest of the resources? So it's some people may, may layer policies on it. might be mm-hmm. a good idea, not necessarily, but you want to look at it in the context of the financial plan. Right. Yeah, it's a, it's a scary thing to cancel those old policies, especially mm-hmm. if you have asset protection involved in them. Yeah. It's, it's going to be a risk to cancel the old policy, and you mm-hmm. just have to determine, I think, for Greg here, if that's a risk he's, he's willing to take or not. Nobody can make that decision for him. No. So, hey, you know, lately uh, we've heard a lot of talk on uh, changes to our healthcare system and mm-hmm. Medicare. Uh, one in particular uh, saying Medicare for all. Mm-hmm. Um, and I read uh, some of your comments on Medicare for all and, and what you think of this concept. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. Uh, can you just uh, offer us up your thoughts on Medicare for all? Medicare for all has become quite of a, I'd say it's either a slogan or a battle cry for a lot of people. But Medicare for all is not specific enough to really evaluate what it will be. There are six different proposals now at the federal level for laws. They, some have some similarities, some are quite different. And no one has really answered the question of how will it be paid for. I'm a nurse and I'm an economist. You don't have to be an economist to know, though, like in any family budget, how will it be paid for? That's still mysterious. So what I really still focus on is that the real problem is it costs too darn much. And Mm -hmm. I think as long as we focus on what's the structure going to be, we are kind of sort of like rearranging the deck chairs on the Titanic because the (laughs) cost is crushing us. And to deal, no matter what, people will not like the cost of it. They didn't like the Affordable Care Act, did a lot of things that improve things for people. But I think one of the biggest mistakes in that was to call it affordable because unless mm-hmm. you're very low income, it's very costly. Mm-hmm. And for Medicare for all, whatever form it's going to be in, unless someone has a magic wand, is going to be very costly. So I'm the, honestly, the rubber hits the road for me on dealing with cost. Yeah, so everybody's uh, looking for a slogan and a battle cry, yeah. something to sell people on that sounds mm-hmm. really good so they can get themselves yeah. in office or elected. But in reality, nobody seems to be addressing the real issue, which is the actual cost of health care, not the cost of health insurance itself. Right. I love that. Um, let me finish with this one question, and that is, you know, I, I know you're not retired yet, no. but what does retirement mean to you? What does retirement mean to me? Um, I heard someone speak the other day. I think it's about, first of all, that retirement, the word retirement, I think, is ill-fitting for many people. But basically, you have financial freedom to make your choices, to live your specific goals in your life. Some people want to leave formal employment. Some people don't. Uh, I personally love what I do. And is there a point in life where I would not do that at all? If, if so, I would be doing something else, I'm sure. 
And so I think it's about financial freedom and having, uh, what did somebody say recently, having enough money, having the purpose to wake up in the morning and having enough money so I can sleep at night. <laughs> and I, I thought that was a really good way to, to put it. And so, you know, if someone will come up with a nifty word, I haven't heard anyone else come up with something different than retirement, but it's about personal freedom financially and, and creatively and personally with your family. I like that. Jamie Hopkins uh, was a past podcast guest. He said, um, he said rewirement. That was one of Oh, the, that's right. His book it. is rewirement. Yes. And I, I like that. We need to rewire the way we think about retirement because it yeah. doesn't just last five or 10 years for a lot of people it lasts for 30 years. And it's, it's an all new career for that matter, or following a dream that, yes. that they've been holding on to since their childhood. It can mean so many different things to so many different people, but at the core it is the freedom to choose. I think the yes. freedom to choose and have the options to follow those passions. Mm -hmm. uh, Dr. Katie, as we wrap up here, I just want to mention again your book, uh, Making the Most of Medicare, A Guide for Baby Boomers, a fantastic guide if you're looking to you. evaluate uh, where you're at today, uh, if you're just wanting to gather some more education, maybe you're getting ready to make that decision, I would really encourage you to pick this book up and read it. As Dr. Katie has said here, you need to have some education, at least a basic foundation before you start start making these decisions so that you don't get yourself into one of these areas where you're, you're spending too much, you're making some big mistakes, and I think this book can help a lot. If you'd like to get this book, uh, Dr. Katie, again, she's actually provided us with the opportunity to provide it with you. She provided us with a box of these books, and in order for you to get one free of charge, all you have to do is scroll to the bottom on your iPhone or go to iTunes and leave us a review at the very bottom of the uh, podcast page page. And if you leave us a review, then you just email us at info at howardbailey.com. That's info at howardbailey.com. Let us know that you left a review. Give us your username. We can get it verified and we will send this out to you at no charge. And she is typically charging $19.98 for something that's probably saving people thousands of dollars a year. So it's a heck of a bargain, even if you don't want to leave a review and you want to pay the whole $19.98. So Dr. Katie, thank you so much uh, for joining us here today. And I uh, look forward to talking to you even more in the future. Thank you, Casey. It's really been a pleasure.